what's going on, everybody? How's it hanging? How's it happening? You guys are this is Kevin from the Chord Progression Podcast, brought to MSUD Rocks, Rock and Metal Thrive. Happy Thursday, everybody. It's September 16th, and I've been working so hard to try and get this band on after I got a taste of their the brand new album, Retrofit. A couple of things happened, but we finally made it happen, and every time I have a conversation like this, I always say these one of the best conversations I've had. This is also one of those conversations. Before I get started, I want to thank our sponsor, Phoenix Fitness. Yeah, you know, live shows, live concert back, jumping in mosh pits, but I won't, don't want to like tap out halfway through. I make sure my fitness level is good. So I'm in the gym working out constantly, but I got to make sure my body recovers right, prepares right, whatever it might be. So that's where Phoenix Fitness comes with different supplements, different pre-workouts, b civil recovery, different creatines, proteins, AM protein, PM protein, after workout protein, multivitamins, whatever you might need to achieve your fitness goals, Phoenix Fitness has you covered. Our listeners to the Core Progression Podcast get 15% off, kind of one, five percent off using the code MSOTD at checkout at fnxfit.com. So be sure to go do that. And thank you, Phoenix Fitness. But now the band Sell Your Scores, they came out with an album called Retrofit on August 20, 2021. And this album hit me in some other way about happiness and why, you know, people always seem so much happier back what, like, you know, when they think about like, you know, the 2000, early 2010s, the 2000s, the 90s, why are people so happy? Why is the nostalgia factor so powerful? Well, Ricky from the band, Settle your scores and I got into it. And when he brings up why he thinks people are so into different things that around nostalgia, it puts the whole album into perspective and we just go in on it because it is the best explanation I've ever heard of why people are so big into nostalgia. It's incredible. You're not going to want to miss out on it. So please welcome Ricky from the band. Settle your scores to the podcast. Are you guys ready? Because your minds are about to be blown. So let's go. Yeah. Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners of the Chord Progression Podcast, I think I've been sitting on this album for about maybe like two or three weeks at this point because some things have happened just trying to get connected to this band, but I really want to make sure I brought them on because their album Retrofit, which came out back in August, was just pop punk glory in its finest. I, I loved every bit of it, so want to be able to talk to them about it, and bing, bang, boom, here we are today, finally making it happen, so please welcome Ricky from the band, Settle Your Score. So Ricky, welcome to the Chord Progression Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited thanks, to be here. Thanks for being on, man. How's everything going in, you know, your world at this, you know, point in time today? Because the world's always changing around us, especially what we've seen after the past, like, year and a half. Yeah, it's been it's been a weird month for me. Uh, I got COVID early in the month. Um, me and my girlfriend, we lived together, and she brought it home from work. Passed it along to me, so that was nice of her. Uh, so I have been off of work for, like, about three weeks now, and... Kind of, it's been kind of nice. Got to work on some music, but I'm kind of going crazy too. Um, I'm finally have been able to leave the house this week because uh, I'm not contagious anymore. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been a strange turn of events. And okay. you know, I'd uh, say that is especially with you getting COVID, especially right around the time when Retrofit was releasing as well. So any kind of release plans that might have involved any kind of live shows, especially if you had COVID at the time, just might've been had to be completely nixed if you had any at that point. Yeah. Fortunately, um, we, we were talking about doing like a traditional, like release show on the day of, and we decided to push that back until like a month or so later, just so that, you know, it gave us more time to prepare and it gave the fans more time to, you know, learn the album. And, and, uh, that way when we have the show, everyone, you know, knows the songs are familiar in that way. We're not playing just a bunch of new songs that no one's gotten a chance to hear yet. Uh, so that was turned out to be a really good move because I don't know what we would have done if we actually had a release show on the day of. I probably, probably wouldn't be able to do it. So, yeah, that would have been a mess. We got kind of dodged a bullet there. But uh, it's, I don't know, I guess it's been kind of nice because I've had more time at home to, you know, promote the album and engage with, you know, messages from fans, stuff like that. So that's been cool. Uh, but also kind of losing my mind. <laughs> Understandable. But at least like when it comes to engaging with fans online, it's you have the time to do that. Plus, whatever if you have a fan of, the, of a, any kind of band, whether it's you as a fan of a different band or fans of your band, whatever they reach out to you online and then you hear back from the artist, it's there's some sort of just this positive energy that gets transferred no matter what, because if there's an artist that you absolutely love and then the artist is going to respond back to your message and connect to you. And all of a sudden it's, you're deepening the ties, you're strengthening the ties of that, that fan to the band as well. 
And then they're going to end up telling their fan, friends about, holy crap, you know, Ricky from Settle Your Scores, one of my favorite punk, pop punk bands of all time, just responded to my message. Holy shit. And all of a sudden, other friends are like, well, what the hell is Settle Your Scores? And all of a sudden, they start listening to it. They start listening to Retrofit. And they're like, okay, now we got to listen to more of this stuff and just keep diving deeper and deeper into it. So by the time the release show happens, they're basically the ones in line begging for tickets, begging to get in. And then there's, you know, some people might have to be turned away because the venue's at capacity. Yeah, absolutely. I think that having that interaction, that relationship with uh, fans of your music is a super important thing. Um, you know, obviously that it all depends on the size of the band. Um, we're a relatively small band, so it's easier to keep up with. But, you know, I understand that a huge band like uh, Blink-182 can't respond to every fan that hits them up, you know. Um, so I think it's super important when you are at, at the smaller level to engage as much as you as you can, you know, and find the time, try to make the time. Uh, Cause it's, you know, yeah, it might, it might mean the world to that person and, it, and to you is just taking a few minutes, a real simple thing to do. So I, we try to do it as much as possible. Obviously we, you know, all have like busy schedules and stuff. So we, it's, you know, there's some that slip through the cracks, but we, we try our best to, you know, anybody that sends us a message or asks a question or something to respond uh, as quick as we can. So your best. I mean, the mindset you have around it definitely makes a lot of sense as a band that isn't, you know, like the size of Blink-182 at this moment to the point where you can have a chance to interact and reach back out to any fan that reaches out to you. If you do get to that certain point, you know, I understand you're not going to reach out to everybody, but you have this pedigree and you have this, you know, habit of reaching like back out to your fans that have reached out to you. It only helps strengthen that tie again. Plus, even as you grow bigger and bigger, and I understand you're not going to be able to get to everybody at some point. However, still the be able, the consistency, uh, consistency of still being able to reach out to people is absolutely paramount. And I've seen a lot of bands, especially more of the independent ones, that are really starting to grow today. And two of them I remember specifically, one is Kingdom Collapse and one is Varsity. It's whenever they get a message on anything, it's even if it falls through the cracks, somehow, some way, they're going to find a way to respond to that fan, respond to that person. And it just strengthens the ties between, again, the fan and the band to the point where now all of a sudden you have a fan for life and they're going to be the ones telling other people about your band. And it's going to be something that's going to be for more of a positive reaction because of you taking the simple time to just give a personalized thank you message to them Say if they said they like the album. That's all it takes. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, especially at smaller levels, like word of mouth is huge that's like one of the most powerful things um because there's just so many bands and it's hard to stick out and it's hard to get people's attention you know you can post your music everywhere on the internet but so is every other band so that word of mouth is really important um because you know people hopefully listen to their friends and their suggestions and stuff like that i mean i've discovered a lot of great bands from people i know suggesting them to me and vice versa um so yeah that's that's huge that's something we try to encourage and we if we can get those diehard fans to you know spread the word that's that's awesome and i have to agree with that as well because with a lot of the press agencies that work with to bring bands out of the podcast it's they'll send me bands that either you know i may have heard of in passing or i've never heard of but it's like hey you want to check this band out okay you know i'll listen to it see what happens and then next thing you know usually end up liking what they send me because they know kind of my mindset they know my musical styles so I was like, okay, now let's get him on the podcast. Let's talk to him. And next thing you know, I'm diving deep in the album. And then I'm driving down the street, you know, blasting 1999 from your album Retrofit. Just got to plug that a little bit. And it's there just people go. are looking at me like, what the heck's that guy doing? You're seeing me just like bouncing around the car, just like having a good old time. People are like, what the hell's actually going on here? And I'm just smiling the whole entire time. So they might be, you know, pulling out their phones like, hey, Google, what song is this? Or Shazam in it if, you know, you're back in 2011, something like that. And next thing you know, all of a sudden, Oh man, I remember that guy in that car was jamming out to this song and now I got to go check it out when I get home and I'll say check it out and then they jump into more songs off retro and they go into your other two albums and they just start diving deeper, not only into your band, but the genre as well. Yeah, for sure. I think that that whole Shazam kind of technology is like one of the coolest things. Uh, so, you know, growing up, I didn't have that. So if I heard a cool song, I had to just kind of try to memorize what lyrics I could hear and, you know, put it into Google or something, but nowadays it's so easy. Like every time I'm watching a show and, you know, they play a sweet song, I just pull up my phone and boom, it's right there. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, it's been, there's, it, it's kind of crazy how the music industry has evolved uh, with all the new technology coming out. It's, 
it's constantly changing and sometimes it's hard to keep up with, but it's also, you know, a lot of, it's, it's better in a lot of ways, uh, worse in other ways, but yeah, it's, it's, it's cool to see that, you know, you can, you can be blasting a song down the street and somebody might hear that and pull out their phone and, and figure out, you know, find a new song that they love. So that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, I absolutely agree when it comes to technology. We've seen that over the course of, you know, let's say the past 10 years where, you know, you know, go back, you can go back like 20, 25 years ago. People were buying CDs because that's how you listen to music. It was buy CDs or listen to it on the radio whenever they would be able to play it on the radio. Then Apple introduced the iPod and then MP3s became just the biggest thing in the world when it came to consuming music because now you had a you had a copy of that music file, but you could take it with you everywhere you went. Then streaming came in and it allowed for the accessibility of people to get into music so much easier, along with Shazam as well, because especially you tie in stream with that. Oh, I listened to us. I heard a bit of a song and I Shazam it. And all of a sudden I can basically go to Spotify, stream that song while I'm driving in the car. And I can basically be hearing the whole entire thing within the matter of like, what, 15 seconds. But then the other issue comes in where how many bands are throwing their stuff online where be, discovery becomes incredibly hard. People aren't listening necessarily to the radio anymore. So it's, you know, you're trying to put yourself on different playlists that Spotify might have, different sponsored things. Or, or you know, when it comes to radio, people not necessarily listen to that. If they're listening to anything kind of like Sirius XM Octane, something on this uh, XM radio stations, but also just the the monetary aspect of it. Because I've had so many people complain to me about the monetary problems with streaming where how many streams you get and you get like a couple of pennies worth for like, like a, a you know, like 3000, 4,000 streams, you get like four cents or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, I have mixed feelings on all that stuff. I mean, you know, us uh, small bands love to complain about how little we're making. Uh, but on the other hand, without, stuff like Spotify playlists and all those algorithms, we might have nobody listening to us and then we wouldn't be making money either. So it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because I think that, uh, you know, the way that people consume music now, it's a lot easier to get heard. If you're a, if you're a nobody, you can, you know, afford to create great music, great sounding productions and get your stuff out there. Uh, independently you know you don't need a label anymore but uh you know it's 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 definitely harder to sustain that because i don't know back in the day it was it was hard to get your big break but once you got it you know you're actually making pretty good money off of music sales and now it's i don't know it's just kind of weird because there's all these bands that are fighting to get on playlists which get their music heard by tons of people that you know you wouldn't have that back in the day but then at the same time you got all these bigger bands that people think are you know killing it and they still have like at least part-time jobs on the side because people are you know really struggling to make ends meet just on a income as a musician unless you're you know a huge band obviously but yeah, oh, yeah. it's weird it's i was gonna say it's, it's it's totally understandable to the where i forgot i was recently talking with landon from the band the plot and you would kind of talk about this where you're seeing a lot more bands stay independent and it's because of just the different things when it comes to the monetary aspect of it to where, yeah, you could, you know, get signed by a label, but it can, that at times can be incredibly difficult as well. Then there's so many other facets of it. But again, going back to the Spotify thing, it's why, why we don't complain about it at times is because it allows for so much more accessibility for so many other bands to be heard and so many other bands to be noticed. But where the, where the complaints come in about it is, you know, it's going to take so many breaks for you guys to finally get to that moment where, you know, even some of those bigger bands where these guys still have part time jobs just to support themselves and you don't think they're ever going to need that. It it takes a much longer time to get to that. I mean, hell, I know a couple of bands that, you know, they're finally starting to do this full time after many, many years. And it's just taken, you know, all of a sudden, oh, they had a hit in 2019. Okay, now you got a hit in 2020. Okay, now you have a hit in 2021 that's being played on Octane every, like, you know, and it's still in the Big Guns Countdown every single week, but still, like, feels like no record companies recognize him. It's like, and at times it's okay, you know. It's just one the things we complain about in the music industry, it's things that might not have been complained about beforehand, but it's just because the way things evolve, it's you're seeing, a, you know, new positives comes out of anything and new negatives come out of anything as the industry changes. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I mean, us personally, like we can, you know, sit here and complain about how little we're paid per stream, 
Um, and I think that's valid, but at the same time, you got to think like if we had been a band back in the nineties or early two thousands, you know, I don't even think we would have been able to afford like a good sounding album. I mean, you listen to, if, if you find bands like at our size from back then, their album sounded horrible because only the biggest bands could afford a uh, good sounding production, you know? So I don't, I don't really know how, you know, we've, we might've not made it very far at all without being able to afford like quality production and uh, you know, being able to market ourselves on the internet. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily worse or better. I don't think it's just different. It's just different problems. Um, but yeah, it, it, it would be great if, uh, you know, Spotify would pay more per stream. I think they could do it. Um, and hopefully that'll, that'll change and improve as time goes on, but we'll see, you know, I mean, we'll see what happens, especially again with live music coming back as well. Just seeing, you know, different revenue streams coming in for bands to the point where, you know, maybe Spotify is going to have to do something. There's going to be some pressure put on. Like I, I've been saying this since last year. It's just going to take what even when it came to the whole entire pandemic with different labels with Spotify, it's going to take that. It's going to take that one major band. It's going to take that one inciting incident to really spark that kind of a change. Because it's going to be like, okay, what happens if all of a sudden, I'll, I'm using Metallica as an example. What happens if Metallica ends up going independent? What happens if Metallica ends up pulling everything off of Spotify because of the little amount of money that artists get paid? If something like that happens, and it, it's just kind of like that inciting incident, it's a catalyst for something else going forward. So it kind of seems like, you know, change can definitely be made happen, but it's got to there's got to be that spark behind it that incites it all. Yeah, I would argue that it would probably take at least a few really big artists. Cause I, I mean, what you're describing kind of sounds similar to like the Taylor Swift stuff that happened, I don't know, a couple of years ago now where she's basically taking her music off of Spotify to try to leverage them to, to pay artists more. Um, honestly, I'm not really, can't really remember what happened with that, but yeah, I think if, you know, a bunch of the top artists put their foot down and said like, you know, we're going to take all our stuff off your platform unless you, increase your pay that that's that would be what it would take for things to change i think they're not just gonna do it out of generosity because you know they got a business to run and they don't want to increase their costs i get that but at the same time it really sucks when you see your numbers it's like man this song's got millions of plays and we made like a thousand bucks you know so <clears throat> yeah i totally I don't know. I would say I totally understand that when it comes to the reason I use Metallica example again using one big band, but I do agree with you to the point where it's not going to take just one artist or one band. It's going to take a large number of artists and a large number of like larger bands. Say like you know maybe 10, 20, 30, where all of a sudden you're seeing you know Metallica, you're seeing like Blink One Eight Two, you're seeing Taylor Swift, you're seeing The Weeknd, you're seeing different artists that are very popular in any different genre start pulling their stuff off of uh, Spotify and all these different stream platforms to ensure that you start getting, uh, they are start getting paid more. Then all of a sudden these streaming platforms are going to end up losing out on that money. They're going to have to make a change in order to make that happen. When it came to the Taylor Swift one though, I thought the reason she took it down was because there was some kind of, there was something going on with the label that she was working, that she was working under. And there was something going on with like the different recordings or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. It might've been like a situation where kind of like with Motley Crue where they didn't own their music and then they took that huge massive stand and got off their record label and then owned the rights to their music. There might've been something like that. I don't remember what it was, but I don't think it was because of Spotify not paying the artist. I don't think that was the reason for it. But then again, I could be wrong. Yeah. I'm, I'm not uh, knowledgeable enough about it to, to argue. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it would take a few artists. Cause I mean, you know, we can blame Spotify all we want, but at the, at the end of the day, it's really society's perceived value of music has gotten a lot lower just because, you know, these new streaming platforms have come out and it's like, Hey, instead of buying a, an album for 10 or 15 bucks, you can listen to anything you want for a whole month for 10 bucks. And that's just too good of a deal for people to pass up. So, I mean, because at the end of the day, like people can still buy music, they can still buy CDs if they wanted to. So if if people really wanted to support the artists enough, they could just buy all their albums and, you know, we wouldn't have as much of a problem. And I'm not blaming, you know, the fans. It's because, you know, I can sit here and complain about about uh, Spotify and Apple Music not paying enough. But then at the end of the day, like 
I use their services. You know, I have an Apple music subscription. I'm not regularly buying albums. So I'm part of the problem. So uh, I don't know. It's kind of hypocritical for all these people to blame the platform, but then use that platform. It's really that people just don't want to pay for music anymore because they don't have to anymore. But at the same time, the whole reason that, you know, these streaming platforms came about is because before that everyone was pirating music. So really it's just, the accessibility of music on the internet has kind of destroyed the value of it because, you know, people don't have to spend 15 bucks on an album anymore. They can just, you know, steal it or buy the single that they want for a dollar, or they can just listen to it on streaming now. So I don't know. It kind of is what it is. You just kind of have to evolve with it and roll with the punches and try to make the best of it. But yeah, it's tough. Definitely. I mean, that's like there's an, there's an economics lesson right there where once, you know, streaming became a big thing, it was the supply of music, not only with how much music is being, you know, out there on these different platforms from these artists, but just the av- availability for anyone to listen to it. So you have so much more supply. But when it came to the demand for that music, the demand never changed. So when you get that supply curve to kind of all of a sudden it moves over and then the demand line does not move all of a sudden the overall price of, you know, like what people would, were willing to pay ends up going way down. Yeah, so it's sure. me pulling out my degree for, for, you know, maybe the third or fourth time on a podcast. So woo, finally there got to go. do that again. Nice. Oh, yeah. I even realized I could have used my shirt for this. Cause I got two like perfect lines here, but not completely missed out on that opportunity so, <laughs> next time. Nice. But honestly enough with, you know, complaining about, you know, talking about Spotify and stuff and all that, because even though I like to talk about that and I love to pick people's brains on it, of course, I do want to talk about the brand new album retrofit because Again, I've been living with this album for a couple of weeks and, you know, as I've been working through it, listening through it, I've got a, like a note sheet on the whole entire album right now in front of me. It's 16 pages long because I did not want to skip out on any detail of this album. And I like, right as I was going through, I'm trying to figure out exactly what the base of the whole entire song, like meaning of the album is like really looking at it, looking at the artwork, looking at the lyrics of the songs, how everything is connected. And I don't know, I kind of got something rather interesting about, it, but I got to ask you first, when it came right into album with the overall theme behind the album, what's the overall theme behind the behind retrofit? Uh, I would say um, the nostalgia of it. You know, we I've always loved that old retro, like early two thousands drive through records kind of era of pop punk. It's always been one of my favorite types of music, and um, you know, we've been doing like the heavier pop punk, easy core stuff for a while. Um, but we wanted to, you know, switch it up, try something new. So that was just something that I've kind of always wanted to do. So yeah, the the whole album is really just like an homage to that time period. Um, like the artwork is <clears throat> like very like, you know, elementary school doodle, like you know, doodling on your on your notepad or something. It's it's all very nostalgic and kind of you know missing childhood and the the good old days. Um, but I think that lyrically there's a ton of different stuff on there. There's a lot of different themes. Um, and I didn't, I didn't try to make every song lyrically fit into that nostalgic element. I think it would be kind of a boring record if there was 10 songs about, you know, missing the past. Cause how, how many different ways can you rephrase that? So uh, lyrically I tried to, you know, incorporate a ton of different themes, but a lot of it does tie together. And I think musically, everything ties together. It's, it's all, I mean, we made a point for every song to kind of sound like that throwback uh, to that old, old school sound. Um, so yeah, that's, and then the name retrofit, you know, I feel like the album would fit a lot. It would fit in really well with the retro, with the retro era and, you know, retrofit is like a, actually I, I used to work at a hardware store and there was like a product that was like a retrofit uh, post base or something for like a deck. Okay. And that's kind of, that's kind of where I saw that. And I was like, it'd oh, be like a very fitting name for our record. So that's where I got the idea from. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically like when they make a part after the fact to add to something existing. So I kind of took that as my interpretation is that we took something that's already been done, you know, that old pop punk sound and kind of, added our own twist to it it's a little more modern sounding um you know and yeah basically took something that existed and put our own spin on it 
I, so, I would de- I'll say listening to it, I definitely agree with you there where it sounds like, you know, it does have a little bit more of the modern take to it. But if I were to listen to sound back in like 2002, 2003, it feels like it would fit perfectly right in there. But then as I was going through it, because of course, just taking a look at some of the song titles and just kind of some of the themes of the overall songs, it's like this, you know, that definite like nostalgia, you know, looking back at the past kind of reflection is there. But when it came down to like a core base and core meaning for the album, I kind of got where you were coming from, but I kind of went a little bit deeper into it to the point where, yeah, you're looking at the past and you're looking at, you know, you know, songs like 1999, of course, you're calling out a year and you're bringing up different, you know, you're bringing up different instances like, you know, Blink-182 playing, listening to uh, Smash Mouse All-Star on the radio, and then going into a couple other different ideas as well, like Q, a QWRTY, I'm like, oh, that's my keyboard right there. I can look at the name of the song on my keyboard. I wonder where that came from. Yeah. But what I really got from it was it's not looking at the past and wishing like, oh, you know, I wish things, I wish, you know, it was like back then where, you know, that like remembering this time, remembering this. I think a lot of it looked at, you know, take a look at where we are now in life, especially no matter what you are or any point in life. Take a look at where you are now and you take a look back at certain aspects of life, you know, when you were in elementary school, middle school, high school, like like in the song, the way things used to be, you know, you're like, I wish we just ate 17. I don't think it's necessarily wishing you were back at that moment. I think it's wish you were back at that moment in like some sort of a headspace to the point where responsibilities aren't as big as they are. Insecurities aren't as big as they are. And you get back to a point where, you know, people are just... You guys were just hanging out with your friends, just having fun, not really having a care in the world, not having to worry about responsibilities with the fact that, you know, I have to go to work in the morning, so I have to miss out on this. You never used to worry about that. You never used to worry about, you know, oh, well, I will ever see my friend again in like, you know, like three, four years. No, you probably end up seeing him, you know, two days later because you guys be doing some stupid shit like going to sledding or throwing water balloons out of a moving car. And yes, I am taking these examples from my own life because we have done this stuff, uh, you know, just street, kind of street racing and then trying to avoid a bunch of street racers because we threw water balloons at them, which was not our best idea. But, you know, you'll learn. But it just kind of takes a look back at that time frame where a lot of the responsibilities that are put on us as adults in today's society were not there. And we felt a lot more free just to do what we felt like and kind of be who we wanted to be. And we didn't have to fit in this certain like preconceived notion of boxes because we had bills to pay. Uh, our families wanted family and style pressures and friends want us to do certain things that maybe we didn't want to do. It's we had more of this free. We had more of this expressiveness to be ourselves. And it's kind of like a nostalgia look back to a mindset of that. That's what I took out of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a big part of it. Um, that whole, I mean, I think throughout our previous albums and this one, uh, that's always been a big theme of like, you know, not wanting to get older and, you know, kind of being nervous about what the future might bring, more responsibility, stuff like that. That's something that I struggle with all the time. Um, and it's it's always going to be a big theme in a lot of the stuff I write. So, yeah, I think there that is a big element. It's like, you know, there's the missing the past, but there's also the looking at the past and just like, I think that's why a lot of people are so nostalgic is because, you know, when you're living in the present and you're dealing with your problems, they seem a lot bigger than looking at the past and being like, you know, back then I had problems, but they weren't really that bad. And, you know, probably 10 years from now, I'll look back on the problems that I have right now and think like, they really weren't that big a deal, but when you're going through it, it seems a lot worse. So I think that's why humans tend to be so nostalgic is because, you know, when you look back, you remember, you remember things fondly. You look, you like the, the good memories seem to stick out better, at least, you know, for childhood, that's how I felt like, you know, there was, when I think about being a kid, I don't think about like doing homework. I think about like hanging out with my friends, having fun. The good stuff sticks out more than the bad stuff. Um, so yeah, like it's, it's not just, you know, I want to be a kid again. It's like, you know, life, as you get older, life gets tougher and it's, it's nice to think about the simpler times, you know, and kind of wish that you could be back there for a little bit, take a little break from, you know, paying bills and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I I think you nailed it. You picked up on a lot of that stuff. Um, and I think that some of the songs like, you know, QWERTY, you mentioned that, um, that song's kind of a, uh, uh, 
look at, you know, modern life, like how we're all so reliant on social media and technology, uh, which, I mean, we kind of touched on that when we were talking about the Spotify and everything like technology is definitely a double-edged sword. It has made the world a lot better and a lot worse of a place, I think. Um, we're all super connected, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much information available, but I mean, we've seen a lot recently, there's a lot of misinformation available too. And, you know, everybody being so connected is causing a lot of problems where people are constantly comparing themselves to other people. And, you know, you know, everyone's getting on Facebook or Instagram, whatever, and posting like the good stuff that happens to them. And then you just see that good stuff and you think, man, like everyone I went to high school with is fucking killing it. Like it's just promotions and marriage and babies and stuff. What am I doing? <laughs> but you don't see all the bad stuff. You know, you don't see all the shit that they're struggling with unless they post that. But no, so, yeah. yeah, I think humans have a really toxic relationship with social media technology and all that stuff. Um, so I think that kind of ties into the nostalgic thing because these are a lot of new problems that we didn't have back then. So, yeah, I think at the element, maybe not even nostalgia, but just time uh, <clears throat> was correct there. Uh, just things changing over time and getting older and looking back, um, you know, reflection, stuff like that. It's, it's kind of all uh, bundled up in there. So, but nostalgia is like the simple uh, Cliff Notes version, I guess. It's like the one word version of it is nostalgia. Right. And I do have to say this, when it came to your description of why humans and especially like you know people that are in our generation where it's like they look back at the late 90s early 2000s period and they have such nostalgia for it is because when you look at the past you focus on so many of the good things instead of the bad things but in the present you focus on more of the bad than the good so right. you know i even look back I'll, I'll go back 10 years ago when i was 16 at this point and you know my my biggest concerns were all of a sudden i was a junior in high school it's like okay where are my biggest concerns my biggest problems were you know playing play, playing high school soccer i what didn't have as many friends as i would have had and me, my best friend and i really weren't you know speaking to each other i'm looking i'm like my god those seem really insignificant to today where i'm taking a look at some of the problems like you know i got like bills continually trying to grow the podcast do all this kind of stuff and I look back, and I'm like, man, those problems seem so insignificant now than these are today. And I know in another 10 years, like you said, I'm going to look back at the problems I had now. I'm just thinking, man, some of these are really insignificant. I'm having a little bit in my head right now as well where I'm seeing a lot more of my friends. All of a sudden, they're getting in relationships. They're engaged. Some people are getting married. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing all these different things pop up on social media. And I'm thinking at times, you know, you start to think, Oh, because everyone else is doing that. And for me, I'm like, am I not doing something right just because I'm trying to build my like a whole business for myself? And then I kind of reflect on the fact that I would have hated to have been kind of in that same position because I was going down that road and I found out that that road wasn't for me. This is the way that I'm going about it. And I'm happy about it. And with QWERTY as well, like social media is a huge aspect of, I think, nostalgia as well, because when you think about social media, again, you're, all you're getting is the highlights of people's lives. You're getting the perfect wedding pictures, the perfect baby pictures. You're getting the perfect this, the perfect that, the curated vacation photos. But you're not seeing those normal day-to-day -day things that you'd be seeing as friends. You're not seeing the struggles. So what ends up happening is you feel like everyone, everyone's life is perfect and you're losing on that human connection. You're connected with so many other people because the internet's a fantastic thing where I can talk to my friends over in Europe right now without a problem. But there is a definite lack of real human connection because you don't get that through a screen. You don't get the body language. You don't get the tone. You don't get the actual physical presence and the energy that that creates. So when you think about that nostalgia factor, again, going back to the time when the internet wasn't fully into social media and is what it is today, people had to connect on a much more personal level. And I think a lot of people miss that, but a lot of people aren't going to make that change and go back to that because of the ease of social media and the norms that are surrounding it. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and uh, I mean, QWERTY, that song is, is kind of tongue in cheek. Um, I don't want people to listen to that and think that I like want to boycott technology <laughs> or that, you know, I, I use this stuff too. Like I'm not, this isn't me, you know, on a high horse telling people how they should live their life. Um, but yeah, I think it's like, in a lot of ways, it's awesome. And I mean, there's a reason that we're all so, it's, it's so ingrained as a part of our lives. Um, but it's definitely like, it's, it's just harder to get those genuine human connections and like those, those group moments, like 
it's just maybe it's just me getting older and and all my friends getting older and having our own lives and stuff but it's it's hard to get everyone together and you know not be on our phones like stuff like that things that you took for granted you know growing up it was real easy to have 10 of your best friends in the room playing nintendo or whatever and you know that's tough now like <clears throat> get any big group of people together and half of them are going to be on their phone you know unless it's like enforced that they can't and that's just like human nature now i guess we're all i don't know we're all sucked into it um <clears throat> so yeah it's again like it has its ups and downs but uh it's definitely i think natural to miss some of that the i don't know i think like i don't know how old you are i assume we're like a similar generation and we had the unique experience of like growing up without technology and then you know near the later half of our childhood it's starting to become widespread so we kind of got a taste of both worlds the pre and post uh social media internet mm -hmm. domination yeah because um, like i would say with me it was when i mean at my house we or like my parents house we didn't start actually using we did they didn't even have the internet at the house until maybe 2000 like end of 2004 beginning of 2005 so mm -hmm. i was like i was 10 years old at that point when that finally happened I had never been on the internet until I was probably nine years old at school. That was the first time I was ever on the internet. So when it came to growing up as a kid, it felt like I had more of that genuine childhood connection with a lot of people because, you know, if we were do if I wanted to do some of them, I had to be there with them to do it. Like at school, we had to be present. All of a sudden, you know, you're going out to play recess. We're all like the whole entire class, all the guys are playing football somewhere in the parking lot. That's always what was happening. And then when it came to, you know, okay, we're hanging out, you know, in my, at my best friend's house. Cause he lived across the street from me. We'd be playing basketball till I mean, for like four or five hours, just having a good time doing it. But it was, you had to be present in the moment. Even if we're inside playing video games, uh, we're playing N64, no internet connection. So you, everyone's got to be right there together and everyone's watching everything together. And then as I got in a, as I got into high school, that would have been like 2009, that's when all of a sudden it was, you know, more people are starting to appear on social media, Facebook. That's when Twitter was starting to become a thing. Then Snapchat became a thing, Instagram, all that stuff. And that's when really a lot of that started to take over. Then I saw that a lot in college. However, when even when I was in college, we finally, we still had some of those moments where my roommates and I, especially my junior year, we, we'd have plans like, okay, well, you know, we're going to go out to the bars or something. We're going to have a good time. All of a sudden it's 9 p.m. and we're going to play Mario, don't, Mario Kart, don't drink and drive where you have to finish your whole entire beer before the end of the race. And you yeah. cannot be driving in the race. Your car cannot be moving at all while you're drinking. And we would do this and all of a sudden we realize it'd be one in the morning. And it's like, well, do we want to even go out to the bars for like the last like hour? No, we just kind of just called it a day at that. But we just like five of us had spent four hours just sitting in front of a TV playing Mario Kart and having a good time. Like it like basically like it was, you know, people playing Mario Kart 64 back in 1999. It was that exact same kind of thing. And it was, I look back at those times and I, I love, I love those times. They were so much fun looking back at it. And now what I kind of miss about those, it's not the fact that what was going on in the world time or that time in life. What I miss the most about it again is the fact that all of us could be in a room together and be present and have just this great time. So now trying to get all five of those guys in a room together again is almost impossible due to the fact that all five of us live in five different places across the world. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's, it's kind of partially, you know, the world changing and all the technological aspects, but then it's, it's also circumstantial, like to your life. I think we just happen to be getting older as you know, the world is heading in that direction. But, uh, yeah, I think, you know, people are just so like overstimulated now. Um, and I think it's, it, it, it can be a good thing and a bad thing. Like it, when we were kids growing up without that stuff, it was a lot, it was a lot easier to be present and not, you know, there's less distractions, but at the same time, it's a lot easier to be bored. Like I try to picture myself if I was a kid nowadays, like I, you, it's impossible to be bored. Like if you have an iPhone or like a computer, like there's, infinite things to do you know on the internet you can learn anything you can you know so many videos and so much entertainment you know and we didn't have that as a kid i didn't have like when i was a kid after i beat all the video games that i got for christmas like i didn't have anything to do um and i think you know kids will probably not experience that that much ever again but at the same time it was it was nice to i don't know 
you know, we had no choice but to go outside and play with our friends. And I can't say that if I was a kid nowadays, I would do that that much. I would probably just be like, I don't know, playing Fortnite or <laughs> whatever the fuck. Uh, <clears throat> But, oh, I know. Yeah. I, was gonna say, I was gonna say I know that like my little cousin, he's that's pretty much what he was doing the whole entire time. Like when he was here in Wisconsin was if he was it's he was just playing video games the whole entire time because that's how he could connect with his friends back in Texas. And I don't blame him for it. And I'm like, well, what do you guys do in Texas? He's like, this is pretty much what we do. And it didn't surprise me. And when it comes to like vi playing video games, I'll still like I don't play anything new. Like if I'm playing something might be Xbox 360, but most time it's still N64. Like if mm -hmm. I'm like, I'll usually do this once a year where I'll pop in Banjo Kazooie and try and beat it faster than I beat it the last time, and just kind of do. I'll do that once a year, and it just, I for me, it just kind of takes me back to that simpler time where it's again, it's I think it's just less responsibilities, but also where the easy, it's kind of more of an easiness to be happy, and I think especially the song, the way things used to be. When I look at that song, I think that is kind of like the the song that kind of really takes the whole entire album and puts it together. And really understand it because when I look at that, I'm like, it's kind of similar to what you guys brought up in the song 1999, but it has more of this reminiscence feeling on when we were like young adults, we didn't have those responsibilities because today we all get wrapped up in things that we have to do in life, like our jobs, relationships, families, bills, kids, whatever it might be. And it just asks, can we go back to, you know, in our mindset, a simpler time and just enjoy life again, enjoy that spending that time together, not being so worried about, you know, we have to work in the morning. We have to do this. We have to follow this. We have to be a part of this. No, 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 no. Why can't we just all just get together one more time? Maybe, you know, once every month, maybe every now, or now and again, whatever it might be, but why can't we just get together again? Like we used to and just hang out, relax, just be ourselves and just have fun. Why are there so many other things that are keeping us from doing this? Just because it's, this is the way adult life is, and this is what you have to do. Why can't we just go back to enjoying life once again? Yeah, it's absolutely. Um, and that song, the way things used to be, I think it's it's got it's it's similar to nineteen ninety nine, but I think nineteen ninety nine is more of uh, you know reminiscing about childhood, whereas the way things used to be is more of the it's more about the connection with the people and, you know, drifting apart from people that you used to be really close with people that you grew up with or whatever. Um, you know, that's just kind of how life goes. People grow in different directions and, you know, life happens. Uh, so yeah, I think they, uh, they, but they both touch on kind of the same subject, but in different ways. Um, that one's definitely more about the human connection. 1999 is more about, uh, the nostalgia of childhood and those times um but i think that at the heart of it all like it's really like 1989 is really not about that time period necessarily there's a lot of references to it obviously but the the bigger takeaway is um you know just missing simpler times and uh like we've had i've seen a lot of comments on that video where people will say like, I wasn't even alive in 1989, but like, <laughs> I still, you know, can relate to this song. So I think that's really cool because, you know, at the end of the day, like it wasn't about that year. It was just about, you know, missing, missing a simpler version of your life, you know? <clears throat> so, oh, understandable. And I was like, for me, I think that why I could took a little bit more of like on the actual year itself was because I was actually around during that year. Of course I was like four or five years old at the time, but there are things I remember about it. And there's things that I do kind of miss. I remember the, just playing video games, just again, no care in the world, just whatever I wanted to do is whatever I wanted to do. And I didn't have to worry about certain responsibilities. I, I, there were no like preconceived, no, no insecurities that were downloaded into me that just kind of like prevent me from doing things. No, if I want to do something, I went out and did it. All of a sudden, like my best friend would tell me, hey man, there's some ants in the ground. Why don't you eat them? I'm like, well, fuck it. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, eight bugs. Yeah, not afraid to yeah. say it because he will definitely tell you the story if you ever ask him. <laughs> but it's just, again, you're bringing back that nostalgia thing. Very kind of similar like what Bowling for Soup did back with the song 1985 when they came out that because mm -hmm. they're using a lot of direct references from that year. However, a lot of people can listen and they kind of bring back this nostalgia factor to back when, you know, times, you know, that before either they were even born or times that, you know, when they were just a, like younger and can really understand that. Similar what happened with 1999 with you guys as well, where people are able to connect with their own childhoods once again. And that's kind of direct connecting more with what you had experienced, 
But when it comes to the way things used to be, that's kind of, again, relating more to the human connections you had in the past, but also the connection you have to yourself as well. Because even when I was listening to it, that song, I just was started thinking about all the times I'd spent in high school with of like my first two and a half years where I really didn't talk to that many people. I didn't really have that many friends. I really wasn't comfortable in my own skin. All of a sudden, that last year and a half just had a whole different crop of friends that didn't go to the same school that I did. And we would just do the funnest, craziest stuff. We just had a good time doing it. It was every day felt like an adventure. And then looking at it now, I'm like, you know, I had one of my friends. It's just, we were at uh Rockfest in Cadott, Wisconsin this year. And all of a sudden I'm like, I'm kind of trying to start to drag him a little bit. Like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I want to make sure you're seeing this show too. I want to make sure you're seeing this show too. And his wife would come along as well. And all of a sudden it's just the other group, we were, the rest of the group we're with. They were hanging out back at the campsite, just kind of ch- chilling. I'm like, live music is back. Let's just have some fun. Let's get, let's just let the, you know, day take us like we used to and just see what happens. And next thing you know, we're going crazy to Limp Biscuit playing break stuff. I mean, and just, it just getting lost in it. And we're meeting a bunch of people around us and making friends with everybody. And it was something like, we're doing this now. And this is the same stuff we'd be doing 10 years ago. Just the, just the freeness of it. And I like, I really miss that. And I want to bring that back as much as possible to the point where, just enjoying life, just enjoying the moment and enjoying where you are and not worried about, you know, like the, the problems that you're having right now, because again, in 10 years, the problems you're having right now are going to seem totally insignificant. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like humans kind of, it's like, we, we don't know where we're in the, the good old days until after the fact. Um, so I think, yeah, just enjoy life, you know, when you can like make those good memories. Um, because I'm, you know, I look, I look back at my childhood fondly, but at the same time, I feel like 10 years from now, I'm going to look back, uh, at this time period and remember all the fondness of that. So I try to keep that in mind, you know, like if I'm having a rough day, like, uh, in the grand scheme of things, like, you know, I have a lot to be grateful for. I've got a lot of good stuff in my life right now. And, you know, when you're living in it, it's sometimes it's harder to see the good stuff and you just focus on the bad, but, you know, I, I think in the future, I'm going to, I'm going to be nostalgic for right now. So, you know, I try to keep that in mind and enjoy what I've got while I've got it. I think that might be the best way to probably tell the lesson that this album tells is again, like you said, nostalgia, why it's so popular is because we remember the good times in the past. And again, going forward 10 years, we're going to look back at this time, even with during the pandemic, you're going to look back at it with some sort of positivity where it's like, oh, you know, you, you couldn't go out, you couldn't do this, but what did you do during that time? I'm going to look back and be like, what did I do during that time? I started interviewing bands. All of a sudden it was once a week, then it was twice a week. And I'm, it's like three times a week as things are opening up. And I'm like, I'm still rolling with this stuff. And I just, there's so many things I enjoy about because every time I see someone pop on in that Zoom interview, it says, this person is waiting. It doesn't matter how bad of a day I had. It doesn't matter the energy level I had. It could be super duper low. And once I see that, all of a sudden, my energy goes from could be low, just very bad day, all of a sudden, high energy, very good day, having a blast during it. And it's something I don't want to forget, but it also calls us to remember that there are good times happening right now. Let's not f- focus on you know the bad times happening right now and then focus on the good times later because we're going to miss out on the good times that we're having right now. Just be, it's kind of like be more in the moment, be more present, just enjoy. We only get one chance at life. Why are we so worried about everything else that kind of comes around it? Yeah, absolutely. I kind of had a a little mini example of that, you know, earlier this month when uh, me and my girlfriend both had COVID. We were both stuck at home, quarantining, not working. And, you know, at the time we couldn't help but be like, man, this sucks. Like we both feel like crap. You know, we can't go anywhere. We're kind of going crazy, getting a little bored. But I kept having to remind myself, like, you know, we're both going to go back to work. And then we're going to miss this, you know, we're going to like, it's cool that we got to spend so much time together without, you know, having to work. So like, I just knew like, as soon as we go back to work, we're going to be like, you know, that was actually, you know, it was, it kind of sucked, but it was also a lot of fun. Like we had, you know, it was great to get that quality time together. So yeah, I think that's, you know, a good takeaway uh, from the album is yeah. Enjoy, try to enjoy life as it comes for what it is instead of, you know, trudging through it miserably and then looking back and be like, actually that was, you know, pretty good in comparison to what I'm going through now. I think you gotta, you know, try to, and it's, it's weird. Like our music, I feel like in our band, uh, we've all like the songs are usually pretty pessimistic 
we don't have very many optimistic uplifting songs but you know i think that's cool if people can take away like a positive message from it um because i don't think like when i write a sad song or an angsty song or whatever it's not the point isn't to make people feel worse or you know i'm not trying to remind everyone how shitty life is or anything like that it's i think that it's it's a powerful thing where like if you're feeling sad or whatever and you listen to a sad song it makes you feel better it's comforting knowing that someone else feels the same way as you so uh i think you know, a lot of our music is pretty pessimistic pretty negative but i think it could have a positive impact on people we've received messages like that saying that you know, our music has helped people in in hard times and stuff like that and that's super awesome to hear like that's one of the reasons why we love doing what we do so <clears throat> So yeah. tech, I'll say technically we call this optimism through pessimism in a way. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's, I like me personally, I, I write most of the songs and most of the lyrics. Um, and a lot of them, you know, it's, it can be a very therapeutic thing where like whatever I'm going through struggling with, uh, I can put it into a song and it, it comforts me. It's kind of therapeutic to get your, your, you know, struggles, your insecurities, whatever, out there and you know it's like worst case scenario like this sucked but at least i got a cool song out of it so it's kind of like a silver lining <clears throat> and you know you can i don't know it's just it's it's i think it's healthy to like get your whatever you're going through out there you know whether it be talking with someone about it or writing a song you know maybe both but yeah i think our our music can have a positive impact without you know being very optimistic songs well absolutely i mean taking a look at again look at retrofit where some of these don't necessarily have you know the most optimistic overall meanings behind them but when you tie them all together it's you understand something more about yourself and it leads to more of an optimistic outlook on life instead of using different pessimism styles to really bring forward this idea that you know remember how remember why you're nostalgic remember how you know you, the good times that you used to have in life, yeah, those good times are happening right now still. You're just not focusing in on them. It's kind of the pessimist side where it's like, yeah, you're not focusing on them, but then it just kind of puts you in this mindset of, well, what if you just change that around? What if you start focusing on the positive? What if you start being in the moment? What if you start instead of just, you know, worried about, you know, the problems that you're having, look forward to what's coming up in your life, like really, like that day or like the next day. And remember that, you know, for especially for me right now, it's, I'm looking back at certain times in life. I'm like, especially take a look at 2020. I'm like, man, how many different concerts did I miss out on? And it sucks. And then I take a look back. Like, well, what I do during that time? Again, I did all this stuff for the podcast and I absolutely love doing it. And I'm looking, it's like, oh, well, I'm having struggling a little bit more, making sure I get all the podcast stuff done. But that's because I get to go to concerts again. I get to be in that moment once again. And it's just, I'm, it's, I, whenever I'm at a live show, I'm so stuck in the moment that all that, like, having that like current form of nostalgia, like nostalgia, but for the now that happens. And yeah. it's kind of like finding a place where you know where that happens for you and understanding why it makes you that way. And then how to make that apply to your, your daily life in a way so that you're always looking at, you know, you know, bad things are going to happen in life for sure. Problems are going to happen. But instead of focusing on it so much, focus on the good things that are happening in life. Focus on the fact that, you know, Maybe some of your closest friends have found the people that they love and are going to be getting married. Maybe you're working well on your business. Maybe it's the other way around. Who knows? It might be. Maybe you just found something that made you happy in life. Maybe you moved to a different place. Maybe you're trying something completely different and you might be scared, but you get, remember the, what you used to be doing may not been as good. It's just taking a look at what you're going on with today and understanding how many positives are behind it so that you don't lose sight of the enjoyment of life that's happening right in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as I, as I get older, it's kind of something I've been trying to work on with myself. Like, you know, I, I can be a pretty pessimistic person, but I'm trying to like catch myself and, um, you know, make sure that I, it's not like a destructive thing. Um, I, cause I, th- I think people like, people like to vent and complain because it it's, makes you feel better. You know, like if you're, you know, I, mean, I think we've all been in like a job that we hated and, you know, you just talk all day with your coworkers and like, man, I fucking hate the job. This sucks. And it makes you feel better. Like that's why you do it. But I think that there's a certain point where, you know, if everyone's just putting out so much negativity 
this is something I see a lot on social media is like, you know, it can be a very negative place. Like everyone just, you know, arguing, bickering, talking about how much everything sucks. And I, th I think that that people do that to cope, you know, like, it, you know, venting about the struggles with your life or with the world or whatever it can make you feel better. But if there's just this giant storm of negativity all the time, uh, I think that's can, you know, make things a lot worse. Like no wonder everyone's so depressed if all we're doing is talking about how much everything sucks. Um, so that's, as I get older, I'm kind of like, <clears throat> you know, I want to complain about this or that, but like, is it really going to make the world a better place to be putting all this negativity out into the world? So it's, you know, I'm definitely not there yet. I'm not this like ray of sunshine, <laughs> but I'm, I'm working on it, you know? <clears throat> And honestly, as I, as I wrap up this podcast, I wrote a little bit of like this overall summation of retrofit and everything we talk about honestly fits honest. Well, we, even what you just finished with fits so well in here that I got to finish up with this. So I said, overall, this album has a dynamic pop punk written feel all over it from its, you know, meant the, mis meant the misery start to really create more of this fun, but also pen train sound to hold your hand along through some meanings to the nostalgic drive of 1999 and the wishing for happiness and bliss in the way things used to be. The band really takes in this mindset of retrofit to go back and find what made you happy in life, why you were happy back then when you were younger and how to replicate that and recapture that in a way today. But they don't shy away from some of the heavier subjects like they did on high spirits and really taking a look at those in this current millennial generation. They force us on this album to remember the good times and remember that everything isn't doom and gloom. But then they show us that life doesn't have to be doom and gloom now. We are the writers of our own destiny. The only thing that gets harder is the work that needs to be put into it. Yeah, I'd agree. That's, it's really cool to hear that, uh, you know, takeaway. Um, I always, I can, I can sit here and tell everyone, you know, what I was going through or thinking about when I was writing a certain song, but I think it's a lot more interesting to, it's a lot cooler for me to hear what people take away from the songs. Um, but yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, I'm glad that you could kind of interpret it that way and have a overall takeaway. Like, yeah. yeah and, it. and when it comes like, especially, I think again, the core of the fact that with nostalgia, it's why we, why you brought up why we like nostalgia so much and then understanding how we can, you know, focus on the good stuff today to make sure that nostalgia factor is consistent with, you know, what we're going through today. Again, just focusing on the positive things. That's the best I've ever heard for an opinion and an, or an idea of why people are such into these nostalgia factors. It, it was absolutely incredible to hear. And it's something that just clicked in my head really simply when you said it. And a lot of it had to do with working through this album, listening through it and trying to understand every bit of it and really getting it like full on force with the takeaways from it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, another thing is like uh, th this album, I wrote like a lot of it in 2018, 2019. So like a lot of it's a little older. And I think that's why um, I, I think I was going through some darker times than I am now. Uh, so it, I don't know. It's kind of funny to, to listen to it and it's just coming out now and it's like, I, I don't I, I think I'm a lot better off in life now than I was when I wrote it. So it's, I don't know. It, it's just kind of funny in a certain way that like, it's finally coming out and <laughs> people are probably listening to it like, man, is this guy? Okay. It's like, yeah, I'm doing pretty well, but you know, it just took so long to get it out there. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, just going through a lot during that, that time period. And, you know, everyone's going through stuff all the time, you know, I've got my own set of problems now, but I think that, like I said, I'm trying to be a more positive person. Um, but that being said, I'm like, I don't know, the next album might be even darker. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, <clears throat> just kind of, it's whatever comes out, you know? But whatever comes out, you know, if it's going to come out like this one did, then just keep, again, with the right out, just keep flowing with the, what you feel personally. Put it out there, put it out there in songs, because if we're going to connect it like we did with Retrofit, my God, who knows what the hell else is going to come up next? What else you're going to hit on to make people's minds just realize something about themselves they had not ever thought of? Yeah, I think that's like the coolest thing about being a songwriter is just being able to, you know, make those connections with people that I've never met, but people that have never met me, you know, we can kind of have a mutual connection like that. It's, it's pretty special. And it's like, 
part of what drew me to songwriting, just being able to express myself and have some person on the other side of the world, you know, get it and, and click with it. So it's awesome. Now they're on the other side of the world. They're like me, just a couple of States away. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, all right, Ricky, as we close out this podcast, I'd like to give whoever I have as a guest on the podcast the chance or if they say what they want to say, plug what they want to plug at the end. So at the moment, Ricky, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, I mean, if anybody is listening and has not checked out Retrofit, please do so. That's our new album. Uh, came out August 20th, and we've been working hard on it for years. So it was a long time coming. Super proud of, of what we came up with. And Really excited for everyone to check it out. That's that's the main thing. Let's check out Retrofit. Check out Retrofit, everyone. All right, now it's time for me to end this podcast with three very specific things. First is, yeah, you're going to want to listen to Retrofit. I mean, you've heard us talk about, you've heard us talk about the nostalgia effect behind it and everything around it. It's a very powerful thing to really get into and really understand when you dive deep in the album, so please do. But you're going to want to follow along with this band. If they, Whenever they get a chance to play live in your area, you're going to want to be able to see them, but you want to be able to follow along with them to make sure you get all the notifications. You can watch your music videos, stream their music, buy their music, whatever it might be. So instead of searching all that stuff up on like, you know, social media sites, YouTube, Spotify, I'm just going to put in the description of the podcast, say find, sell your scores online, links, tags, descriptions, everything. So it's a one-click, one-stop shop for you to go places, for you to get in the sell your scores and make sure you listen to Retrofit because, well, I know convenience. Convenience is key. I'm going to make it happen for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, second thing, Ricky, whenever I have guests on the podcast, I make a certain promise if I enjoy having that guest on the podcast. This happened 100% of the time. That streak is yet to be broken. So, Ricky, my promise to you is this. This is not an if. No, 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 not an if because if implies possibility. When implies certainty. When I can see seller scores play live for the first time, my promise to you is this, sir. First round's on me. Hey, I like that. Perfect. All right, Ricky. So on that note, I cannot in good conscience say goodbye because that seems too final. Made that promise. I'm going to keep listening to Retrofit because, again, it just hits on all those different factors and I still can't stop listening. So I will not end this podcast by saying goodbye. I will end it with this, though. See you later. See you soon, man. Well, well, folks, in a review with Ricky from the band, sell your scores. Remember, Retrofit is out now, so check the link description of the podcast to make sure that you listen to the album. Go buy the album. Go buy some merch. Go follow them in every which way you can because you're going to want to see his band live, especially if you like pop punk. Please remember to follow us here at MSOTD Rocks, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you're getting the podcast as well as some of the other videos we make. Also, you can listen to the podcast, Bible Podcast, iHeartRadio, hopefully Amazon at this point as well, because I know I got the invite for them. Make sure that happens. But yeah, this is an incredible podcast. Also, thank you, Phoenix Fitness as well. Remember, 15% off at fnxfit.com. Use the code MSOTD at checkout. But if again, if this podcast, if you're going to take anything away from this interview with Ricky, it is live in the moment. Enjoy the positive things about the moment, because when you look back in, on life, you look back, you know, 10 years, you're not going to remember the problems yet. You're going to think the problems were my new. You're going to remember the good times, the happy times. But why are we so focused on like the things that are going wrong and things are going rough today? Let's focus on what's happening now that it's good in our lives. Let's focus on the good things. Let's just remember the good things so that when we look back again, it's we remember the good things. We remember also enjoying the good things because I'm doing that right now after this podcast. I got to go you know, to my buddy's bachelor party. I've known him since I was three years old. Yeah. After shooting this. Yeah, that's what we're doing. You're looking forward to it. So that's going to be for you guys. Thank you for watching this to the Chord Progression Podcast. Brought to SVD Rocks, Rock and Metal Thrive. Because my name is Kevin. And you guys know how I end every single one. He's up to the big, healthy, and hearty. See y'all.